There was a short time many years ago when I was a soldier and um, yeah I've never been in combat but I was well aware of what could have happened and in particular there was something that was really terrifying me. Iron Dome is somehow special. It is a very high-tech and expensive reply to a low-tech, cheap threat. One would consider this a losing proposition, and it is a losing proposition under some circumstances, particularly in the light of the recent events in Israel and Gaza. But there are other sides of the equation that make the Iron Dome a success. But let's start from the beginning. Since the 90s, the HZB forces used to launch artillery rockets and fire mortar shells from Lebanon to the northern Galilee against random targets. At the time, there was no possible protection. In the early 2000s, HMS, active in Gaza, started working on the QAWSAM rocket. The rocket was and still is very imprecise and of little military value, but it was used to attack all sorts of targets in Israel, damaging properties and causing loss of lives. And Israel had to react somehow. In February 2007, during the Peretz administration, it was decided to greenlight a project for a system capable of engaging artillery and rockets, and Israeli Rafael Industries took the position of main contractor. The system was heavily subsidized by the US, which ended up footing about 50% of the development. Raytheon was involved, and even today, they build key components of the interceptor. The financing of the project is a very complex subject, and uh, quite a controversial one, so I won't go into any depth on this. So, building a viable system for this specific purpose was not an obvious proposition. I mean, the interception of relatively slow projectiles in ballistic trajectories doesn't seem difficult in the mid-2000s. But in this case, we are talking very short-range systems with a flight time measured in tenths of seconds. The reaction must be extremely quick and the effector must be very fast as well to intercept the threat at an altitude that limits the damage of the explosion on the ground. Furthermore, these threats are cheap and easy to build and the interceptor should be, well, cheap and easy to build as well. Furthermore, the interceptor should be capable of crumbling the threat and self-destruct to limit the damage of the falling debris uh, because they will fall in populated areas. Not an easy task. The Iron Dome project started in 2007 with the system declared operational in 2011. Since the system was designed from the ground up, this was a very short time. Those who took part in the development say that they acted as if they were a startup, minimal procedures and minimal bureaucracy. Commercial of the shelf's components were used where possible. Uh, one of the legends surrounding the project was that to speed up the prototyping, they used components extracted from a toy car sold at Toys R Us. The first battery was deployed in Ascalon and it intercepted the first target in April 2011. The exact number of Iron Dome batteries built and deployed in Israel is not officially known, and it could be between 10 and 20. Uh, the system has been exported to various countries, and a naval variant was developed, but these are out of scope. Between 2011 and today, there have been a few small improvements, but the system configuration remains unaltered to this day. There have been several estimates of the effectiveness of the Iron Dome, even independent estimates from the academic world. Some say that the effectiveness is very low, 5 or 10% of successful interceptions. I have reason to believe that official estimates are more accurate. The percentage of successful interceptions should range between 75% and 90%. So, what did they do to achieve such a good result in such a short time? The exact configuration of the Iron Dome is definitely not well known if compared with the Russian or American systems. I believe that some deliberate disinformation has been spread in the media by the manufacturer and the IDF, and you will see why in a minute. 
So, the Iron Dome, like any other air defense system, is organized in batteries. Each battery has a radar, a control unit, and three to four launchers, potentially spread at some distance from each other. The system is usually photographed set up on the ground, but it seems that could potentially be used where still on the transporter lorries, albeit not while moving. The radar is a flat AISA radar built by the Israeli ELTA. The control unit, which is the only manned component of the system, is, well, nothing special per se. It is a container for two or three crew members. Uh, there are no pictures of the inside that I could find, and there are no details available about the systems inside. What is particular is the software running the system, but we will talk about that later. The launcher is a pretty classic box launcher with 20 interceptors ready to fire. Even this one doesn't seem to be rotating, but the launch position is almost vertical, so I believe that the missile doesn't really need to be pointed in the threat direction. The launcher is palletized. When empty, it is removed from the base with a crane and a full one is then mounted. It is not clear if it could be manually reloaded when partially empty. Well, but it seems reasonable, to be honest. The interceptor is the Tamir missile. It is a smallish missile, 3 meters long, 16 centimeters diameter. The weight is declared to be 90 kilos, which is on the light side for a missile of this size, but not entirely unfeasible. The steering is governed by the front fins, which is a pretty common configuration for high maneuverable light missiles. These allow for quite a high lateral acceleration when the missile engine is on. When his office is a different matter, but this is not a video about missile dynamics. Most sources say that the missile guidance is electro-optic, which means infrared basically, but this is not the usual tip of an electro-optic system. There are infrared guided missiles that do not have a transparent lens. There are plastics that are more resistant to thermal shocks and lighter than visually transparent material. These plastics are opaque to the visible light, transparent enough in the infrared to let the sensor see outside. However, the tip of the missile is usually not pointy because the geometric shape would reduce the transparency in the center of the field of view. So I suspect that we have a small radar, maybe a semi-active guidance system, behind that cone. I may be wrong, but it seems reasonable. It is not clear if the missile has a data link or it is just pre-programmed at launch, but I have reason to believe that it has indeed a data link, even though it is not mentioned by the sources. Uh, I will explain when we talk about the performance. The radar and the control vehicle are connected by cables, so the two should be at maximum a couple of hundred meters from each other, uh, because it is, well, the maximum practical distance for a non-permanent cable connection. The control the control unit and the launchers, though, are connected with a wireless data link. The mast is clearly visible in many pictures. This means that if line of sight is available, they can probably be deployed a few kilometers from each other. Why is this important? Well, because it is going to influence the performance of the system as a whole. The official sources say that Tamir missile has a maximum speed of Mach 2.2, a minimum range of 4 km and a maximum range of 70 km and I don't believe in any of these three numbers. Probably Mach 2.2 is a measurement in some type of theoretical ideal conditions uh, because when the missile is launched and flying around, sonic banks are usually not reported. Eyeballing the system performance, it doesn't seem very fast. It can probably go supersonic in some intercept profiles, but the 2.2 number seems not to be representative of the real-world performance. The minimum range of 4 km is not realistic either because it is very long. Light missiles usually require a few hundred meters to arm after launch, uh, just enough to clear the launch premises. Moreover, in the available footage, it seems to hit targets at a relatively low altitude near the vertical above the launcher, which seems closer than 4 km, honestly. The 7 km as much maximum range is also a ludicrous number. It is probably the maximum ballistic range in ideal conditions without maneuvering to intercept anything. Uh, not a situation that may happen in real life. A more reasonable idea, though, comes from another official number. Uh, the system allegedly can protect an area of 150 square kilometers from short-range ballistic threats. 
With the help of some elementary math, this means a radius of 7 km around the launcher. This may seem short, but consider that here we are including also low trajectory mortar rounds whose flight time is short and do not rise high in the sky. Probably rockets or artillery launch it on a higher trajectory, the range is longer. In any case, this is not a long range for sure, so the possibility to space the launches a few kilometers apart, thanks to the wireless connection, is important to increase the area that a single battery could cover. Some areas will be covered by overlapping launches, some others by just one launcher. We have visual evidence that the Israelis don't always do this, but it is an interesting possibility nonetheless. However, this is not exactly what is usually termed an area defense system, like the SM-2 or the SAM-T or the S-400. This system can engage a target flying through an area not directed at the missile launch site. The Iron Dome is designed to engage threats that are going to land in a specific area. These are two different things. In fact, the software is designed to ignore threats that are going to hit unpopulated or non-valuable areas to focus on the most dangerous. This feature, in the case of the Iron Dome, is relatively easy to implement because it is dealing with free flight targets whose trajectory can be calculated with a good degree of precision. Bigger system, though, must be capable of engaging maneuvering targets, which requires a much higher dynamic capacity. Being designed for this type of target makes the life for the Iron Dome somewhat easier. The big hurdle faced by the Iron Dome, though, is the cost of the missile. I have seen numbers ranging from $50,000 to $120,000. You could argue that the value of the defended targets is much higher, actually priceless, but the threats are mortar or artillery rounds or unguided rockets of various types. These are very cheap and very common, and they will always be available in larger numbers than the interceptors. We know that on the 7th of October 2023, HMS launched between 2,400 and 5,000 rockets in a very short time, and the system was simply overwhelmed. This was not the first time a large number of rockets was used, but the density of the attack was unprecedented. The designers had this type of saturation attacks in mind, and beyond trying to build a cheap missile and having 20 Tamir ready to launch for each launcher, they tried to build a software capable of defending the area in an intelligent manner, maximizing the utility of the launch missile. We already mentioned the capability to ignore the threats that are not going to hit anything of value, but please observe this footage. First, notice that often the interceptors are launched in couples. This is common practice for air defenses to maximize the probability of intercept. This will be important in a minute. Second, notice that they fly in gently curved trajectories towards calculated impact point, and then you see a short burst of light marking the warhead explosion. Here, we can see a couple of missiles flying that sort of low trajectory we mentioned before, and these are probably the most challenging for the system. Also notice that the Iron Dome can manage plenty of missiles in the air at the same time. And this is quite challenging for the fire control radar and the data links. This could make us think that the missile is mostly autonomous to alleviate the launch station workload. But this would also mean that missile deconfliction would be a problem and the weapon allocation would not be ideal. I mean, it should be pretty common to see two, three, four missiles engaging the same target. 
But then you see this. And this. As you can see, the missile can fly pretty complex trajectories and in some cases also seems to be reaching the falling target from the back. And these trajectories, well, don't seem to be particularly efficient, even more so against a non-maneuvering target. So I think, that's my speculation, that what we are seeing here is a reallocation of missiles on the fly. The second missile of a couple directed against a target, well, if the first one is successful, seems to be allocated to a different target that is still dynamically within reach. And this means that the new trajectory of this second weapon won't be ideal because they had been fired against one target and then they are diverted toward another. Another possibility is that since the calculation of the impact point becomes more and more precise as the threat proceeds through its trajectory, a missile suddenly finds itself targeting a non-dangerous target and it is reallocated to another one. This means that A, there is a data link talking with the missiles, B, the fire control system is doing quite a complicated job. And that is quite impressive, indeed. So, thank you very much for watching so far. There is a small addendum at the end, so I would suggest not to go away right now. If you like this video, please do the usual youtube -y stuff, uh, like, subscribe, hit the bell and so on. If you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon by being a member or by one-off donations, I would be incredibly grateful. In the same way, I am enormously grateful to all the people who are already supporting the channel. You are absolute stars. So, thank you very much for watching. And say, uh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. There is one more thing. So, there is footage about sort of lasers engaging the HMS missile barrage. Well, these are basically fakes, not because the Israelis are not developing a laser weapon just to fix that problem of the cost of the interceptor, but because it's not ready yet. In the same way, laser weapons for destructions are not ready. This is a technology that is coming, but is not ready yet. Some would say that laser weapons are the weapons of the future and they will always be. But I don't think so. They will be here in a relatively short time. And this is really the end. So thank you very much for watching and see you next time. And stop.